So, yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess just want to keep, uh, for, for those of you in the audience, keep in mind that we do have some projects that are relatively mature, others are not so mature, some are very early. We want to make sure that uh, you are aware of this mix of projects, take the ones that are actually the lowest hanging fruits in your context, and uh, work with us, we'd be happy to work with you and make the other transition. Yeah. Now, going back to the IP discussion that uh, was part of by Bombardier, uh, yes, IP discussions can be tricky, but in terms of that, uh, as Bhakti have mentioned, uh, they had a long-standing, uh, substantial relationship uh, with CMU. It turned out that uh, GM has a master agreement on campus, uh, which basically covers any research that GM uh, does on campus, not just the two labs that uh, Bhakti have talked about. So yes, there will be some initial uh, pain that we have to go through, but we are happy to work with uh, individual uh, companies and agencies uh, each uh, situation is unique, uh, but the Mohali situation is unique as well. Right? We'll be happy to go through the process, and once the process has been gone through, this master agreement has been in place for a long, long, long time. Right? After that, everything is extremely streamlined, we can make things, make things happen very quickly. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess I, I'm not in the industry, I'm in the academic industry, and I guess I, I guess in this day and age, I have a good bit of problem with the whole tech transfer model, and it's going to get operates anymore. I think it's an innovation diffusion model that we need to respond to. So, Al, I'm going to ask you a question. It seems to me if you're talking about the private sector, uh, innovation of the private sector, it's how you market it to potential users. If you're talking about an innovation in essentially the public sector, in both the public sector, um, you know, you've got to rescale. The only way to rescale is something that we've said around standardization, which argues for a more standardized procurement process for the public sector, whether it's state departments of transportation or uh, transit operators or whatever. Did you see that as a it, process? It's, it's probably not only standardization, but also uh, something almost the opposite, where it says you want to invite creativity. And I, this so you want to make your procurement process friendly to that. That's exactly right. In fact, I was don't do that and talk about technology transfers. Uh, there was a recent meeting of about a dozen heads of DOTs that Jim Bloss was there, uh, the head of uh, Barry Shoke, the Secretary of Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. He was talking about, you know, how do I energize and, and tell the private sector I got the welcome mat out? And part of it is, well, maybe I do um, unsolicited procurements. And find a way of accommodating interesting and, in, and interesting in the outside world um, by first, you know, we talked about transparency of data and so on. And it's a buzzword, but it's not. If you really make data available, uh, and that's pretty much what happened earlier with uh, this week with Secretary LaHood talking about safety. Use this stuff. He was encouraging because it was a mix of uh, researchers, but it was also a whole lot of people from private industry encouraging them now to you know, take this information and, and uh, find a market for it. Um, but part of it is is the welcome mat part of it. But, uh, the public agencies have to do. So I, I think it's both. In one case, uh, somebody mentioned uh, uh, 5.9 as a as a standardization now that's going to really help. So there's a case where standardization really helps. So I think my sense is you got to come both. I don't know. I'm speaking from my standpoint, but maybe Jim or Steve or or uh, or, uh, or Jim Jim Risman have a, a different thought. I, does it sound right or is it? Yeah, um, we do have, um, I'll say, a fairly open process um, with our uh, RTQs, um, the way we solicit. I, I think part of what I would say is, are we asking for the right thing? And that sort of gets back to the unsolicited proposals. I think, I think our approach to say, here's what we want, works. Our approach to say, and again, how do we know what we should be asking for? Um, Maybe lacking. We do, like right now, the way we, we have about a $7 million a year uh, research budget, and we pretty much solicit in-house um, uh, through our highway administration where most of those projects, solicitations come from. Who has good ideas? Over the past, we had some uh, sit-downs uh, with like faculty from Penn State, faculty from the University of Pittsburgh, and had some brainstorming what are innovations uh, in the world of technology what are the problems periodic problems that that 
Department of Transportation has. Um, that's probably been 10 years since we've done it that way. Um, that way you get in, uh, again, part of the problem with, with uh, uh, opening the door for solicitation of problems is then it excludes the, the entity that came up with a good idea for how to move forward. Um, so that was sort of the, uh, the issues we've had. Yeah, I have to chime in there because for people in this room, they're kind of down lower on the chain from the federal, the federal and state dollars flow to people like the county and the city and Scott Parker back there from like Pittsburgh. And when we try to spend that money, you know, the design manuals are 10 years behind, the innovative things, and we have to comply with VM1 or else we have procurement policies that we're forced to do. And you know, we do spend about $4 billion in our region, not just in Allegheny County. It's a little less now every four years but we're very very restricted about how we can do it and if we ask for a waiver it takes a long time and i know you know and i know you know so there besides the fact that you might want to hear an innovative idea sometimes we really have to get a little more movement in that process and i'm sure you're probably trying <laughs> but part of it is certainly setting the stage right yeah uh, it's clear I mean, you know when you think of the traditional formation of transportation departments on the public side, you know, part of this drilled into every engineer's head is, you know, protect the public, protect the public. Right. It means you get more and more uh, nervous about straying outside of some bounds. Um, now we're sort of saying the opposite, but we've got to do it with care. And I think the uh, Gary's comments was were right that the, you've got to think about these things in stages. Um, and also get them get this audience for her you know our you know, in the grand yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah in response to you know, the protecting the public and opening a, a specification so that there can be some competition uh, you know where Jim was going you know we're on this at the point where we're trying to encourage development of, of specifications for innovative products where the, the, the public's being protected because they're assured of getting good value, getting a good product. Because too often we've seen an open spec that's made to protect the public and ultimately you get a product that is worthless because you know, somebody will did that open spec and meet the specification but ultimately it's they, they work their way around. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think those are good points. I mean, uh, let's we'll keep it on the list as something that you know, part of setting the stage to allow this transfer to happen, uh, allowing creativity and so on. Other comments? Yeah. Um, Matt Troop, Takata. Um, so the question was, how do we get technology transferred to, to industry? And we talked briefly about the IP and the licensing issues. Um, two other options that often occur are spin-off companies where she makes a company to commercialize the technology or a product. Uh, that's an effective way to get it out there. Um, another mechanism is through graduate students. I'm sorry, through? Through graduate students. Oh, sure. Yeah, graduate students learn the material, they learn the technology. They go and instead of just uh, a handoff, they can actually integrate it and implement it. And that's another great way to get it out there to the industries for the students. Okay, great, thanks. Just to clearly, uh, you know, I know there's a little bit about the CMU setting, and uh, Ann will uh, know the Penn setting, but um, having graduate stu students working on real life projects uh, in the public side has been, has not only been incredible, but it's just, it's just really, you know, I, I now have the pleasure of, of being, hearing a few report outs of their work over a past semester. And the excitement in the students is uh, it's just really, yeah, Rick, you, nobody knows that better than Rick. Um, I was gonna comment on a different uh, aspect. Of it. I just wanted to make the relatively simple observation that tech transfer is made a lot easier if you start out with a really good problem definition. Um, if you know what problem you're trying to solve with technology, uh, it helps a little bit uh, to get uh, to get uh, get it actually deployed. And um, I think that, and I'll make this obvious point about the consortium. One of the important parts uh, 
of this kind of discussion is to be able to dig down in the future and, and really define problems to, uh, to uh, feed the process of technology transfer. Good point. In fact, I'm thinking of a comment you made, Pat. Uh, Christoph made a presentation earlier. Uh, Christoph Morris made a presentation about using camera uh, to now provide a whole log about the surface condition of roadways and so on. And Patrick said, well, I've got to get uh, Christoph to meet with my people because now you need to know from our standpoint what we really need. And, and finally, uh, it's the, uh, the coupling of those two sides of the, the equation will produce now uh, a definition of what you really want to do. That's a great point. You really got to define exactly what you need in order to uh, start figuring out what the transfer, uh, technology transfer hurdles are. Yeah, Pat. I guess Pat has with the city of Pittsburgh, and I'll take that even further. If you want to transfer me technologies, which we're doing right now in East Liberty, there's really about five things we need to go through. First is what Rick was saying. You have to come to me with very clearly defined benefits and a solution that's addressing the need that I have. In this case, in East Liberty, that was congestion. But then we got to talk about the funding. We're all about funding in the public sector these days, so we have to have some sort of viable funding strategy for implementation. But it's also important to have a realistic demonstration project. Instead of trying to do a full-blown implementation, if we can define a, a, a realistic and doable demonstration for the project, it helps us vet through some of the little issues that we may have. And lastly, which is what held us up, it's the legal aspects of it. We've got to get the ownership, the maintenance, and the liability all figured out. We can deal with those five components. We're good to go with our transfer technology. I only got four out of that, Pat. Clear benefits. Clear benefits, the funding, realistic demo, and the legal. Yeah, I guess I added to that clear benefit, but a, a, a well vetted solution. In other words, we'll have a technology that that you can show that really produces those things. <laughs> yeah, Raj? Yes, uh, that's, I think, very good set of uh, comments there. I want to respond to the comments from uh, Dr. Takada, uh, Dr. talking about startups and students. So it turns out that uh, Carnegie Mellon has an extremely well-defined uh, policy for <coughs> startups. Technology developed at uh, CMU can be spun off, and the policy, I think, is called uh, give 5% and go away in peace. So basically, the CME will maintain 5% of ownership of the technology, and then uh, a faculty member and or a student will actually spin up the technology. So for example, if Takara is interested in a piece of technology, you could work with the corresponding faculty <coughs> member and or students to basically spin it up. CME gets 5%. You could, for example, invest a small amount of money into the company as well. The company is up and running, and everybody wins. It's a win-win-win all across. So it's just a very nicely streamlined uh, policy. On the student front, I guess let me make this an open invitation to all of you in the, in the room. If you're interested in hiring any of our students, be it the undergraduate level, master's level, or uh, PhD level, let us know, let Al know, let Stan know, let me know, let, uh, uh, let Dan know. I so we basically make sure that uh, when students basically are uh, graduating and looking for a job, we'll be happy to make sure that uh, a copy of their resumes are uh, being sent to you. So that we'll have uh, first dips of them, right, which I think basically, again, a very nice uh, way of uh, transfer technology uh, mindset with people. Particularly as uh, more people are retiring from these agencies, there's a good way that we fill the gap with uh, technologically savvy uh, students. So there's actually a flip side to that, because sometimes the companies come in and take the students before they're actually done. So uh, from our perspective, that's actually, we have to be a little wary about that. But if they're finishing and they're available, Definitely something we would like to see. Kind of like basketball, I know. <laughs> so, yeah, Aaron, please. Similarly, students can do internships, and this, like, especially over the summer, grad students, their schedules are work out quite well in summer internships. That's a good point. Internships really are, are really helpful for not only students, but uh, hopefully for the employers as well. Yeah, that's just good. Yeah. Other comments on the subject of deployments or, or tech transfer? Yes. Uh, I have a question um, because I'm not well versed in how all this works. But um, when these research projects get, uh, when the concept of doing a research project comes up, is it is it because somebody in the uh, private sector, public sector, has brought this problem to uh, to the research? 
facility or, or what? I'm trying to figure out, I mean, the way that they would, to me, get deployed is if there's that communication from the get-go that it's not a research person, uh, faculty member saying, I think this is a problem and here's how I'm gonna fix it. Um, but there is actually a problem and here's, here's how I know it's a problem because there's actually data behind it. I'm gonna ask the folks in the audience from schools to answer that. Uh, I'm not sure I'm the best answer. I think it's all those things, but how does research, how do these research projects get started? What's the genesis? Is it someone to simply in the research, in the university community, thinking of something that they think is important? Is it triggered from talking to others, either a public or private sector, that say there's a problem? Uh, how does it go? Greg? And then Raj? This isn't, uh, in fact, Raj and Dan should answer this as well. This isn't true of every project, but um, um, the whole idea behind Traffic 21, I'll, I'll, I'll somewhat repeat. Um, actually, when we started out on that whole set of research projects, many of which you've uh, heard some uh, <coughs> something about today, not all of which you've heard about, but um, we actually did uh, a couple months of meetings with, in fact, Kathy, I think I met with you during that period, um, but Al Beeler and uh, Steve Bland, Steve, I still remember Steve saying, I've got far too much data, no information, right? Uh, you remember that? You have to fix the, yeah. I know, I think we're still working on that. This is research, for God's sake. Um, but uh, seriously, all the Traffic 21 projects were driven by first that survey of the community, which was really Henry Hilton's instruction, by the way, and then we put it together into, and, and at the time, we were in discussions with Penn, but this was internal to CMU only, into an internal solicitation, wherein we outlined in a couple pages this series of problems that we heard about uh, out there in the community and in the state, and asked for responses of folks with technology ideas that they thought might address those problems. So when I heard about potholes, Lo and behold, uh, a proposal came in from Christoph. said, well, gee, we know, we might be able to help with that problem. And uh, kind of fast forwarding, I think that now with the consortium, we have even a stronger capability uh, for the two universities to hear about those problems and to map them into, if you will, internal solicitation of, of researchers. That doesn't mean we're not gonna have a whole lot of faculty that have ideas of their own that are you know, they're gonna be off doing, but, but um, I think for purposes of the discussion today, we're really hoping that the problem statements will come, and, and Kathy, they will form partnerships uh, in terms of problem definition uh, so that we can bring technology to bear. But I should. Yeah, Raj? Yeah, let me add to that. Uh, so the projects within the UTC that you heard today uh, went through basically were chosen from a very similar uh, solicitation and uh, selection process. Uh, but the, the past is past, uh, that's, that's the list of projects we are committed to for the next uh, year and a half, two years. But uh, as uh, Al pointed out, we expect there will be more federal dollars flowing in. Right? So we would be very interested in your inputs, your suggestions about what kinds of projects would make the most sense for you in terms of uh, tech transfer, deployment, test pilots, and so on. So we would be, I guess, our ears are open for suggestions, uh, and we can basically turn that back around saying that these are the kinds of problems that we are interested in. There's basically a huge amount of very deep expertise across campus at CMU and at Penn. We can find the right candidates to basically uh, deliver on those projects. So, so, so treat this as an opportunity to basically give us ideas. Thanks. Aaron? And, and as, as soft money people, we're constantly chasing money. So if you've got a great, great problem and it looks like a great research problem, we will find a way to chase money with you to try to get resources to do the problem. Uh, I also think that the website could be a good form for something like this where if, uh, as part of the consortium, if uh, kind of suggestions came in, then you could find some natural partnerships between the, uh, the university researchers and, and the problem itself. That would be, I think, the, the way to proceed with kind of future ideas. Let's, let's spend a couple of minutes talking about potential research. Problems, just problems that you folks have, and whether it's the private side, the public side, um, that are just sort of continuing sort of, and it could be pretty mundane, everyday stuff. 
that we wish there was a solution to. Please. Yeah, Scott. This is Scott Berger from Lake Lake. Yeah. Eliminating fatalities. Uh, didn't hear you. Eliminating fatalities. Uh, eliminating fatalities, okay. Uh, we're going to do that with connected vehicles. You just have to wait. Oh, yeah. no, I'm not being facetious. Fine, okay. Okay. Yeah, I can follow up with Scott. Uh, what we're really trying to do is accommodate a higher mixing of modes in a given carpet. We've got a lot more bikes on the road now. We've got a lot more pedestrian traffic crossing and intersecting the road. Ways to better improve both safety and the efficiency of movement in the carpet with that mix of traffic. Okay. That's the basis of our problem. We talked a lot about detection and sensing Know, being able to read information about it, that's one part of it. Part of it is you know, we're using the most effective mix, you know, whatever that means, right? Uh, we'd, we'd all love to be able to, to reduce vehicular travel uh, by encouraging more people to use transit. Steve has to maintain the system. He's not allowed to knock out 500 drivers. Well, the solution can be both in the vehicle or with a pedestrian. The solution could be in the infrastructure itself, somehow more clearly designating when or where these modes are going to be operating. Okay. Or the solution could be even more policy oriented in terms of educational programs and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, these are real basic, and I totally agree with what Pat said. It was one of the things that was trying to point out. But the other one is we need materials that last longer, whether it's pavement or paint or whatever. We need things that don't cost us as much and are maybe more environmentally sensitive along the way. Okay. So not something that all kinds of companies work on, but <coughs> you know, it's all too expensive and it all falls apart too fast. Okay. Chief. Thanks, Chief. To help peak smoothing. I'm saying it. Trying to address uh, peak smoothing. We run through these incredible peaks and valleys of the man. I think there's a way to try to smooth that out and, and balance the resources. Yeah, that's huge. Some of that may come to public information. I heard a lot of the conversation earlier about, uh, I think Jim was talking about, well, gee, if I close the Squirrel Hill Tunnel and I know that this detour is 70 minutes is 15, you know, hey, if I know that I leave 10 minutes earlier, it's quicker, or 20 minutes later, it's quicker. Um, but maybe that, has, that maybe that partially has an impact. But just anything around, you know, getting away from, Everybody in, in this city or any other who complains about the empty bus is just looking at it at the wrong time of day. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wanted to add to that too. It, it's um, the idea that maybe government employees do have to show up at work so people think they're getting their money worth, but why do we have to work you know, all at the same time? Couldn't there be some way that we can ask people a way that we can use our infrastructure better? And did you all figure out how to Eliminate congestion on the front of the list, because that's another one. That might be a personal issue. Well, it's our worst. It is our worst. You know, the URS, Keith, I mean, he does the analysis from every two or three years for our comp plan. It is the worst congestion in our entire region. And it's really bad all day long. Yeah. I, I know if you, if you work for a university, by the way, you, you, you take care of the, the peak work problem because I get emails at 4 o'clock in the morning on <laughs> what people are doing. Ron. Well, I mean, one of the big problems we try to solve is consuming less energy. So obviously as a rail and public transport, we are in the public transport, but even in the public transport, when we work on electricity, we try also to reduce the amount of electricity. So we have to have a lighter train to be able to be, uh, able to be more with less on all the subsystem in the train and things like that. So this, Regeneration of, of power also, as we are able to, to use the power and regenerate and things like that. So all these problems are, are in key. Uh, yeah. They are key around, around the world, uh, obviously, for, for the reason what we know. But uh, I think reducing energy in general, it's not only conjunction, but uh, there are other, other things we can do. Yeah, that's a great point. What about, uh, let me pick on Ron, uh, you're right here just a minute. Uh, one of the things I talked to your boss, Ron, is with Mid-Ohio Trucking, uh, major trucking firm located in, uh, in Pittsburgh. And one of the things I recall was uh, the need to have 
although I, I'm not just drawn from, from the beginning of the real time data isn't good enough, you know. You've got to have it not predicted, right? But uh, aside from that, I remember hearing from your boss talking about the lack of real time information. So if there's an, an incident, you know really that the information is trustworthy. But there must be other things in your industry that are continuing to be vaccine problems. I know you, all, you folks have also spent tremendous amount of energy on safety issues. But anyway, that, perhaps you have a comment on this one. I think in the cities it's the peak period. You poke the, poke your little. I think in the cities it's the peak periods too because you can't predict in the daytime when the trucks go. They run irregular routes. They go to the same general areas every day, but they don't go to the same specific spots. At night it's a little, it's a little bit different. They run between terminal locations. But you need that information, and the telematics are on the trucks. Yeah. We can have the information, but I think in real time, I think it's important to know what's going on in that time. Most of the time, you get the information so they can react. There's also been discussion about having uh, connected vehicles with trucks so you can have platooning and have much more even flow of vehicles. Are you folks into that kind of we are discussion? Not. There are some parts of the industry that <laughs> come in with like uh, longer trucks and heavier trucks. It doesn't work in our operation. Yeah. Did you have a comment, Rex, on the, Rex is, uh, in the waterway side of the world? It's, it's, a, it's another part of our business that we often don't think of. Yeah, I'm probably the odd man out on transportation here because I am in the waterways industry. However, um, I see a lot of carryover from what was discussed here today. Now, RVQV is vessel to vessel instead of vehicle to vehicle. However, with the exception of the high speed that was dis discussed earlier today that <laughs> of us don't have, a lot of the other projects really have carry over. Um, I think my point of view, and it's, it's been my point of view because I've been in the industry for a long time, is, is that all modes of transportation need to have an overarching policy. Those cars that you're talking about moving quicker and the projects you're going to do on them are great. However, if my barges don't get unloaded or his trucks can't move, then those cars aren't going anywhere because it's just going to congest the highway. And I can go on and, and get on my soapbox forever, but there is a lot of technological overlay. So when I'm looking at what you put up on the board there, I'm interested in what you're developing, not only because I might want to borrow it or steal it or but to see how it will work to make my industry better with what your technology is doing today or going to be doing. Okay. Would you mind just mentioning the, the stuff that you folks are interested in on the waterways with the water stuff? I don't think anybody knows about it here. Very few know about it. <laughs> well, first of all, we've had a tremendous uh, rapport and partnership with CMU for years through the Port of Pittsburgh. Um, I think it's been going back almost 12 years now doing different projects. Um, recently, as a matter of fact, very recently, just last week we signed a contract, uh, we put out an RFP to, uh, to build a wireless waterways ITB, uh, a test bed, internet test bed. Um, that project is the start of what we will hope to be a national project. The test bed itself is going to be right here in Pittsburgh. It's going to be uh, uh, well, the first first spots are going to be Lac Chua and Amman, which is erratic. Lac Chua and the Allegheny, which is Aspen Wall, down to Emsworth, uh, Lac and Dam, which is mile seven on the Ohio, and it will go down about a mile further to a place called P Wars, which is the Army Corps of Engineers facility on Neville Island. We'll come back and light up our building right downtown. Um, that is being set up. The money is there. The money's here. Uh, contract sign and construction is supposed to be starting first of June. Long story short, we are working with robotics uh, in particular on uh, their mapping of the waterways and their capability of using sensors. Um, some of you know or may not know, but they, they went out and built, I uh, gotta love it. <laughs> I think these guys never got out of their childhood. They built little boats that they control with joysticks. They put the sensors on the front of the boats, and the real neat thing is they use uh, cell phones to tape to the back of the boats to send the information back to them. So uh, we're, we're fortunate because we're, we're working with them 
and seeing how that they can adopt or adapt their project, that particular robotics project, in conjunction with our partners, the United States Army Corps of Engineers, United States Coast Guard, and industry. Thank you. There's a lot of things going on. I mean, it, you just sort of doesn't, you know, get on your radar screen, no pun intended, but uh, that's another one of the aspects. But really, the interval sort of business really can't be forgotten. Yeah. And it's true that we, the interconnection and making the systems all work together really critical. Yeah, and I, I sit here and, and think about this and don't want to bore you, but one barge holds 70 tractor trailer truckloads. Now, the average tow on the Ohio River is 15 barge units, roughly 22,500 tons. Divide that by trucks. And think about what would happen if one of our lock and dam went down and we had to take that off the barges and move it by trucks to get to the facility. Sure. Like you talk about traffic congestion. Hold on. No. Just. Yep. But, 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 but that makes Ron really happy because he's. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, what are the problems that you just sort of strike you that we really ought to be thinking about? I, I would mention that uh, uh, earlier we talked about, uh, Stan Smith talked about the adaptive signal project uh, in downtown Pittsburgh and then now in East Liberty. Um, and it makes some pretty interesting, interesting opportunities. Uh, to me, that's one, it sounds so simple, um, but if, if the test turns out to be anything like the bench test, there's huge uh, benefits to be gained. It's just, it's just astounding. One of the things that also struck me that I kept on thinking about the sort of the urban design and the, and the, the interest in trying to get uh, infill development in brownfield areas. One of the problems that folks who own traffic signal systems have is trying to keep their system up to date. And when they adapt the signal systems, they get up to date about every two seconds instead of going out and retiring them every two years. And it also makes it now reactive then to different development patterns. And it has a tremendous opportunity with, with developers who may not have to also put a whole lot of new money into infrastructure or, or expanding the existing infrastructure as typically uh, road owners require because maybe you get more out of the system. So there's some really interesting benefits. Yeah, I raised this one earlier talking to the CMU folks, but I'll do it again. Um, for us, it's maintaining consistent vehicle spacing in a network. Um, as we've consolidated our route network, we have a lot more service in specific corridors. Some corridors we're running every two and a half minutes at peak hours, so the challenge is in frequency. It's avoiding bunching and gaps and all of that. So how do you use, whether it's sensing technology, the predictive, predictive technology, predictive modeling, traffic signal technology, not to speed necessarily speed things up, but just to keep it, keep everything moving in sync. Discussion about making parts of Pennsylvania real extensive test beds. The opportunity to couple, I mean, that, that, your comment triggered that thought. There are so many interconnected things that it could be very, very interesting. And I think that was, frankly, the inspiration that that, uh, that Henry Hillman offered three or four years ago was the notion of let's go capture and use this area as a real testbed area. And it could be across a whole series of fronts. Um, the opportunity to do just that, to now have your system now work more uniformly, have the signal system respond to it and understand it, potentially give transit uh, preference the way it really falls in that sweet spot. And I can think of, um, Maryland, I can think of uh, 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 Park PGH and expanding the system. The, the layer on top, now people who, who have with an application in front of them an easy way to understand what parking garage now has space so you don't have to circulate. Um, the good work that Robert uh, Hampshire mentioned. Again, one layer on top, we can really make a system much, much more. Other comments? Rick. Al, this is uh, knowing we're getting at the uh, witching hour here, if, if yep. you will, for uh, the special presentation. Um, 
before we end, it, it strikes me it might be a good idea to just get everyone's quick feedback about how often we should be uh, bringing everyone together. That's a good question. We, we have been thinking about um, at least once a year to get this group together, but it could be also much more frequent. Um, any quick comments on that? Does that sound about the right cycle? Um, we also uh, would love if you would uh, allow us to to periodically contact you, you know you you folks individually because we may, just may have an issue to run through and you can just help us with guidance. But um, does, does it every year, or every six months sound about right to you? Any general reactions? Okay, there's a couple of, uh, head nods. So I'm, I'm going to take that as a uh, under advisement and say thanks uh, thanks for, for, for that. Uh, we'll try to do it at least every year and, and we'll see how it goes uh, as well as it should be should be uh, more often. Um, with that, uh, anything else? I, I just want to add that uh, the formal meeting happens uh, once every six months or once a year, but for each individual agency or uh, partner, feel free to come talk to us and we'll have individual meetings and facilitate uh, like a rapid technology transfer. We'll be happy to do that. That's a great comment. You've heard an awful lot to, to, you know, to digest in one, in one day of the kind of research that's going on in transportation. It is very rich. And as you sort of now sort of digest that, if, if ideas or problem statements, statements come to your mind, please, please let us know. Um, with that, um, I am, it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Carnegie Mellon's president, Gary Cohn. Gary? Thank you, Al. All right. Al, where do you want us to sit? Uh, where do you sit in front of you? There's, wherever you're comfortable. Uh, I think we'll probably more comfortable sitting in the audience. <laughs> This is obviously a very serious session. Boy, I, I'm here to be your comedian to bring some, uh, some lightness to, the, to what is a very serious day. Actually, we're delighted by um, this event. Delighted that uh, uh, it's happening at all. We hope you had a good symposium up to this point. And uh, I'm very glad to join you at this moment to celebrate in an official way the launching of the, uh, of the consortium. Uh, welcome to all those staff from Carnegie Mellon, and uh, my congratulations to my colleagues from Carnegie Mellon who are part of this. Uh, welcome to the community uh, participants who are with us, and a special welcome to our colleagues from University of Pennsylvania. Are there people from Penn here? Two of you. I still have to get to the airport right now. So uh, to fair enough, that's okay. <laughs> And knowing our transportation challenges here, I'm sure we'll have plenty of time to do so. Uh, well, it, as you know, uh, this is a formal partnership between Penn and CMU, and I have to tell you, this is a especially meaningful moment for me, because I'm a Penn undergraduate, civil engineer, and there are still was civil engineer, and I took transportation engineering from Wuhan, Wuhan, in about 1960. Seven or sixty-eight. He's still is he still with us? He, he's uh, retired now. He retired. Just retired last. Year. You still see him? Yeah. yeah. Say hi for him. <laughs> you remember me? I was the worst student in this class. <laughs> hey, uh, so for me as president of Carnegie Hall, I'll be presiding over this uh, joint center with the University of Pennsylvania is a special thrill, as you can see. And this is the official kickoff, if you will, of the consortium for technology for safe and efficient transportation. Uh, from my perspective, I think I can speak for everybody here, uh, this is very important for lots of reasons, but most of all because your research agenda is such an important uh, agenda for the city of Pittsburgh, the city of Philadelphia, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, for the nation, arguably for the world. Not that we expect great things from you, but no pressure. Uh, you're working on uh, smarter and safer uh, roads uh, and, and vehicles. You're working on more efficient, more effective roads, bridges, and infrastructure. Uh, less congestion. Less congestion means reduce air quality impacts, better use of uh, precious uh, resources. 
these are extremely important issues, ones in which if we make progress, I think we can have tremendous impact. Another aspect of this, which is very important to both regions and again to the Commonwealth and the nation, are the technology innovations and commercialization opportunities that uh, come out of this research, something that we also uh, expect great things for. Um, congratulations to all of you who made this possible. Uh, it's something we're very, very pleased about. Uh, my purpose more than anything, though, rather than tell, telling you what you know already, is to offer some thank yous to those who have made this possible. Uh, there are a lot of people to thank, and I, uh, I run some risk in signaling out a few people, but I'm going to do it anyhow. Uh, Dave Roger, Dave, would you at least wait, turn around <laughs> so people can see you? Uh, that's okay. Dave is headed up the Hillman Foundation. And uh, you probably all know the Hillman Foundation was uh, crucial in funding the Traffic 21 effort, and they still are, which became the basis for the Carnegie Mellon part of the University Transportation Center. Uh, Dave has not only been a great philanthropist, but has been a wonderful partner in the substance of this whole effort. One of the more brilliant things uh, he and Henry Hillman did was to help us identify Rick Stafford as the executive director of Traffic 21. And Rick, you want to? That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Rick was the perfect guy because he was of us, faculty member at our Heinz College, but also someone very tied into the community, both locally and in the state. He did a great job with the feds as well. Uh, he's been uh, the perfect guy to, uh, to uh, take us to this point. We're very grateful. Uh, another person I want to sit a lot among my colleagues, is, my colleagues is Rick McCullough, the Vice President for Research. And I saw Rick walk in on the uh, The man with the uh, wounded wing. Uh, Rick, in his role as Vice President, did a marvelous job of corralling the faculty, and the faculty know what I mean when, when we talk about hurting cats and the, uh, the challenge that that represents. Rick did a great job of marshalling the university's resources to make Traffic 21 and now the University Transportation Center a uh, uh, something we can be proud of. Uh, but the person I want to thank more than anybody else is Henry Hillman, which he won't like my doing, but he's gonna have to put up with it because he's sitting here. And he's not that fast anymore. He can't get to the door and put it it was three years ago when Henry invited me over to his house to chat. And it turned out that uh, Henry and Dave had been thinking about uh, the next big thing for Pittsburgh. Uh, what could Pittsburgh undertake in the way of technology development and application, which would both improve our city and help to put Pittsburgh on the world map again and for one more reason. And it was their idea that transportation would be the thing to focus on. Uh, this led to Traffic 21, as we call it, and it led to, in particular, I don't know who coined this, I don't know if it was you, Dave, or Rick, Stafford, but our d, &D research, development, and deployment. So from the moment this was conceived, it was thought of as something where the faculty would engage fully with the community uh, so that the uh, technologies we're developing, the applications we were creating would be responsive to community needs and have real impact in the community. It was a brilliant idea and in fact we've stayed true to that and it's been I think uh, a major reason why we've been successful. Uh, and it is very impressive what has been produced in a very short period of time. Three years is short in the life of a, of a uh, university. Henry and Dave have come to appreciate that that's the case. We think of ourselves at Carnegie Mellon as especially rapidly moving and flexible, and indeed we are, but still there's a certain time constant in all that we do, and there's no exception here. But we did move quickly. Uh, we've got some great research going on, some marvelous partnerships with Penn, with Pitt, with, uh, with um, uh, uh, communities. Uh, 
the city won this wonderful Smarter Cities contest, IBM uh, held, and um, we give the city all the credit for that, but certainly Traffic 21 and our partnership was a key part of it. And of course, the culmination up to this point was winning a university uh, transportation center. Uh, that is a tremendous achievement. I, close to, even though I did so lousy in Professor Richie's classes, I know enough about transportation. Indeed, I, I have to admit, I was on one of the early national evaluation panels organized by the TRB to review transfer UTC applications. It said to be in like the late 80s or something like that. Not one of the great moments of my life, I'm trying to put it aside, it was a very painful process. <laughs> and anyway, I know how competitive this is. And especially for two universities that don't really have transportation engineering programs, but rather brought something very different to the table in our uh, technology leadership and our ability to, and willingness to apply it to this uh, area. It's a, a tremendous win. And of course, I want to emphasize it's culmination up to this early phase. We have a long way to go, and I think this has positioned us for tremendous success. But I can't emphasize enough, this was Henry's idea. It was Henry's money that got us uh, going. He's been a steadfast supporter, and once again, showing his tremendous leadership of this community and what a great partner he is. Please join me in thanking Henry Young. expect you to say anything, but you've never been someone at a loss for words. Yeah. Here's your chance. No? Okay. Very good. He's also a very wise man. Yes. Uh, we're very pleased that while uh, Secretary Ray LaHood, Secretary of Transportation, Ray LaHood could not be with us today, he did go to the trouble of recording a message for us. And uh, I'd like to cue that up now and hear what Secretary LaHood has to tell us. Hello everyone, I'm Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood and I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. But I want to offer a big congratulation to my friend Dr. Cohen and everyone at Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pennsylvania for being selected as a University Transportation Center. And of course, none of this would have been possible without the support of Henry Hillman who had the vision to encourage Carnegie Mellon's Traffic 21 initiative. Americans are builders and engineers, researchers and inventors. It is in our DNA. After all, we built the Transcontinental Railroad, put a man on the moon, and created the world's first network of highways. Bold American ideas that were made possible by generations of researchers and scientists. Earlier this year, the Department of Transportation awarded $77 million in grants to 22 university transportation centers. And we were proud to provide $3.5 million to power the advancements taking place at the technologies for safe and efficient transportation. The work that you are doing ensures that we keep the American tradition of innovation and creativity alive and well. I'm incredibly proud of the research that is happening every day at Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pennsylvania. This program represents the best the country has to offer. And I can't wait to see what you develop in the coming years. The Department of Transportation has embraced innovation as one of our core principles. We are using technology to find new and ingenious solutions to the problems that millions of Americans are facing. And whether it's cars that can warn a driver of an unseen danger, or bridges that can be deployed in a single weekend, innovation is at the heart of transportation in America. So please keep up the great work and know you will always have a friend at the Department of Transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. <clears throat> My thanks to all the faculty who have made this possible. 
talked about the, the leaders and the funders, but it's really you that have done the work that, it, that bring the substance to this. And like the Secretary, I'm very proud of what you've accomplished, and we expect great things in the future. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Raj Raj Kumar, the George Westinghouse Professor of ECE at Carnegie Mellon, and the Faculty Director of our uh, University Transportation Center. Raj. Uh, let me just add a few words to what uh, President Cohen had to say. Uh, first of all, let me extend my heartfelt uh, gratitude, Mr. Hillman, uh, for his uh, vision, his unmatched philanthropy, his deep trust, and commitment to the region. Uh, thanks. Uh, so let me. Uh, So let me thank this uh, opportunity. Take this opportunity to actually uh, thank uh, the administration of the university, specifically Dr. Cohen and Dr. Uh, McCullough, uh, for uh, their comprehensive and unconditional support for uh, transportation research across campus. It was not uh, a few months back that actually uh, Jerry took some time off of his very busy schedule and actually met with uh, senior administrative official from the Department of Transportation, which we believe uh, helped uh, the process along. So my thanks to Jerry. Uh, <laughs> so let me thank uh, all of uh, you consortium members who are present here for your openness and willingness to understand, foster, test, and hopefully adopt some uh, technologies that uh, we are in the process of developing. So thanks to you. <laughs> So, so lastly, I just add that uh, so people, I guess, who have been exposed to the history of the region know that uh, both the cities of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia have actually gone through a uh, uh, major renaissance right, of uh, very different kinds, very deep kinds. Right? And our hope uh, for the region is that uh, we will become a technology and business hub for transportation. Right? I would like to refer to this as Transportation Valley, but I'm not sure it's the, it's the right name. Yeah. But uh, so hopefully, uh, CME and Penn will actually be the brains of this, basically this emerging uh, technology and uh, business. Uh, right? So without further ado, let me thank you all again for uh, your support for your presence here today. Thank you. <laughs> well, let me just uh, close out the day by, uh, by Thanking my uh, uh, our management team, and it's going to be just great to work with with Raj and Dan and Stan and uh, and Rick Stafford and and all of the researchers who have uh, who've talked so much about today about the various aspects of, of some pretty exciting work. Um, but I, I need to to give you sort of a personal note. I I met with Mr. Hillman uh, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things he said was uh, he said, "Can you tell me a little bit about what?" might be some of the stumbling blocks that would that are sort of in our way that are challenges from getting this work out into the deployment area and I'll just tell you that we spent uh, Henry a, a, a good bit of time this afternoon talking about that and I can tell you as a guy who was involved with a large agency before um, the work that is in front of us is not only exciting it is it is on a rocket ride and uh, we're not going to let that stand in our way I just want to say thanks to all the consortium members and, uh, and uh, the support of the university has been great. This is a new experience for me, but it's a great and exciting one. Thanks an awful lot. Thank you. Have a good trip home. Yeah, I just want to say, right? Yes, I think